It's wonderful to uh, be with you in fellowship. We'll continue our worship now as we uh, come around God's Word together. As uh, Carl mentioned, my name is, is Alex, and I'm here with my wife, Nia, and uh, we have three children, Noah, Ivana, and, uh, and Arthur. And uh, we attend New Community Church. It's just over in Ingle Farm, just a small little church over there. I'm a uh, builder carpenter by trade, and, uh, and I, that's my day job. But I'm currently also studying pastoral ministry at uh, the Master's Seminary over in uh, Los Angeles. So um, it's, it's, it's certainly a surprise last night to receive a, a call from, from Carl. I was halfway through uh, cooking the barbie, uh, had a couple of lads from church over last night, and uh, thankfully I didn't burn anything and the food was still edible, so, uh, so that, was a, that was a blessing. But um, when I asked Carl who had passed on my name and my number to him, and he mentioned Les Crawford. And uh, uh, it was lovely to have a, a connection straight away. I, I don't know Les personally, but, uh, but I remember him as a kid, actually. He used to come up and preach in the little church that I grew up in, up in the Barossa Valley back in the day. And uh, I think if I remember correctly, I reckon he used to have a black ponytail um, many, many years ago now. So, uh, but it's, it's wonderful to, uh, to be here with you this morning. Thank you so much for welcoming us along today. If you have your Bibles, please keep them open with me to Matthew chapter 7 this morning. Matthew chapter 7, and we're looking at the parable of the two builders this morning. And Carl gave me free reign to choose any passage. Um, I chose this, one of my favorite passages of all times, not just because I'm a builder and, and the construction imagery that the Lord uses in this, in this parable, but even more because of my own testimony and my own walk with the Lord. I had the blessing of being raised in a, in a Christian home, a home where the gospel was, was opened readily and, uh, and Christ was, was, was shared in my home. It was a home committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Even thinking back now, I, I can remember as a kid making many professions of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember praying the sinner's prayer even in, in Sunday school and, uh, and thinking at that time that I was very much a Christian, even as a, even as a kid. But by the age of 12 to 13, though, uh, growing patterns of sin in my life really troubled me, and so I, I made a second profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ at the age of, of 13. To so many people that knew me during that time, I gave every appearance as of being a, a genuine Christian. I was involved in the life of the church that we were attending. I went to youth group. I, I knew the Bible well. I wasn't openly rebellious towards my parents, aside from the odd burnout in my car every now and again. But for the most part, I was a pretty good Christian. And uh, after all, I'd said, the, I'd said the sinner's prayer, and I would participate in the Christian activities of the church. I would listen to sermons and so on. But it wasn't until the age of 17 when I came to genuine saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And once I truly was a believer, I could look back over that time and see that for years, for years I'd lived in self-deception. Even though I'd built what appeared to me and many others as a life of, of genuine Christian faith. And that's why this passage is so important to me this morning, because of the difference it has made in my own life and the way that the Lord has used it for me. Sadly, self-deception is rife in the church today. We live in an age of cheap grace where there are so many teaching that you can accept Jesus as Savior, but not submit to him as Lord of your life. Self-deception is rife within the church today. The church is full of people who say, yeah, I love Jesus, but I just want to live however I want to live. Never even thinking for a moment about the seriousness of sin. There are most definitely people out there today who are just like I was. They've made some sort of profession. They've prayed some kind of prayer, but yet they live in self-deception. And if you really were to examine their lives, peel back the layer of their lives, you would see that they are missing a foundation. 
They are missing a heart that longs to love and submit to Jesus' lordship over your life. And so with this message this morning, I want, to care, I want us to carefully look at the story of the two builders. I want us to look at the similarities of the two builders. And I want us to look at the separation of the two builders this morning. Ultimately, so that you might be encouraged in your obedience before the Lord. I want you to be able to examine your heart this morning and see the greater areas in your life where you need more submission to the Lord Jesus Christ today. And so this, this passage that was just read for us now, you, you'll notice it has two very distinct parts to the passage. Verses 21 through 23 contain the warning itself. The warning against self-deception. The warning against making a false profession in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then beginning in verse 24 down to verse 27, Jesus gives us an illustration of that same warning. And he illustrates it in the form of a parable. Now, the parables are a a style of teaching that that Jesus used, and they are word pictures laid alongside truth, laid parallel to truth. That's where the word parable comes from. They are stories that drive home a truth. And this parable is absolutely no different this morning. We have a simple story of two builders, but alongside that story, we have a spiritual truth, a spiritual reality that Jesus is ultimately trying to make. And so in order to understand the spiritual truth, we must first look at the simple story elements of the parable. So first, you have the wise builder in the parable. Jesus calls this man wise, meaning he's a, a man of insight. He's a prudent man. And the reason why Jesus calls him wise is because of how he chose to build his family's home. Notice verse 24. He built his house on the rock. And what does that mean? Well, again, just at a simple story level, it means that he dug down through the the sandy soil of of Galilee when he was building his home, and, and he dug down until he hit that limestone bedrock underneath. This is something that would have required a lot of effort, something that required a lot of work. Sometimes that bedrock can be a long way down. And it's not like the modern convenience of today's building practices, bring in the the excavator and dig a trench. No, this would have been by hand, pick and shovel, until he got to that bedrock. And then he began to build his house off of that rock foundation. At some point, after he finished building his house, There was a massive Mediterranean storm that blew in, and it tested that house. Notice verse 25. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against that house. You can imagine this this gentleman, he's sitting inside his house. He's quite timid, he's quite scared, watching this, this storm blow in. But verse 25 tells us the outcome, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. At the same time, at a simple story level, that wise man had a neighbor who was also building a house next door at the exact same time. This man is called the foolish builder, and the reason why is because of how he chose to build his family's home. He built his family's home on the sand. He built his home without any kind of foundation. You can imagine this. It was probably the the dry season when he went out to his plot of land to begin that building. Yep, this feels uh, pretty solid enough. I'll just uh, build my house off of this. But at the same time, that massive storm tested his neighbor's house. It also tested his house as well. It has tested his building methods. Notice verse 27. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against that house. And notice the different outcome. And it fell, and its fall was great. So that is just the, the simple story elements of this parable this morning. Most of us can picture this imagery that the Lord Jesus Christ uses here. And it's important to begin with the basic elements of the story because they become clear with the context in which they are spoken. Notice in verse 24, Jesus begins with the word, therefore. And that immediately links this parable to the warning just behind, the warning of false profession in the previous verses, verses 21 through 23. Jesus is still talking about this same danger, the danger of making a profession in Christ that is not genuine. So then it becomes clear, right? The wise builder in this story, he is a genuine Christian. 
The foolish builder, the foolish builder, he is a false disciple of Jesus Christ. Someone who's made a profession in Jesus Christ, yes, absolutely. But they don't really know Jesus. And the two very similar first century homes, they represent the external lives of two professing Christians. Lives that without careful inspection seem almost identical, really. And that's the basic story elements of this parable before us this morning. But as we seek to apply the spiritual lesson, we have to dig a little deeper. Pardon the pun. So secondly, let us consider the striking similarities between these two builders. The striking similarities between these two men and their houses. It's funny how often Christian literature, children's Christian literature especially, can, can often misinform or skew our ideas of, of, of Bible stories. I remember this particular Bible story, I looked it up in a few of my kids' books, and the imagery was very similar. It had a picture of, of the house that's up on the cliff and another house that is down on, on the beach. And, uh, and often we can have that, that imagery in mind when we think about this, this parable. But if you notice, as we just read, Jesus uses almost identical language here when he's talking about these two different builders. And in fact, it's crucial to his main point for us to see and understand what these two men have in common. Jesus intends for us to picture two almost identical houses standing next to each other, side by side, in the same street. There's no one house up on the hill and one house down on the beach. They are together. That's just at the simple story level, absolutely, yes. But even at the spiritual level of the story as well, I want us to notice several striking similarities between the wise man and the foolish man. Let's note these similarities together. First, in verse 21, notice that both men made a profession of faith in Jesus as Lord. Both of these men profess Jesus as Lord. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. That is what initiates this whole warning that Jesus then speaks this parable about. Jesus recognized that there were people that were attached to him, people who had heard the gospel from him, people who had professed him as Lord, but they weren't committed. And that's what initiated this entire warning. So understand that that both of these men made a profession. And Jesus pictures two kinds of people, the false and the genuine disciple. But both of them say, Lord, Lord. They both profess Jesus. Notice verse 22. They continue that even until the judgment. They claim to be his. Not only did they call him Lord, Lord, but the second similarity is that both men heard the teaching of Jesus Christ. Both men heard the gospel. Notice verse 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine may be compared to a wise man. Verse 26. Everyone who hears these words of mine will be like a foolish man. And so understand that they are both similar in that they both listen to Jesus' teaching. Both can hear the gospel being presented. You know, a person who is a genuine Christian, as well as someone who is self-deceived, both can enjoy hearing the gospel. Both can enjoy hearing Jesus teach. Both can enjoy studying the Bible. They can enjoy listening to sermons about the Bible as well. Both the genuine and the false. There's a third similarity between these two men. Both built seemingly Christian lives that look the same externally. Clearly, these men built two houses in their culture that would have appeared largely the same, next door to each other in the same location, probably similar in size, certainly similar in appearance, same building materials, stone, plaster, same roofing materials. There was much that these men had in common with their houses. And you see, one of the points that Jesus is making here is that the difference between a true disciple and a false disciple is not always easy to tell. Because of both a profession, professing Christian, genuine and false, can often look alike. You cannot always tell which is which. Both can be building visible Christian lives. Both appear to be members of the visible Christian community sometimes. They can both go to church. They can both listen to sermons. 
Why is that? Why is it often hard to tell the difference? Because the foundation is down deep, hidden from view. And we can understand this even on an everyday basis, right? Take the streets of Adelaide here, for example. You drive down the street in, every, in, 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 any, in any suburb around here. And you imagine with several of those houses, the builder decided to try and save a little money. And instead of pouring a foundation, he just leveled the ground out and built a house straight off of the top, right? Driving past it, you wouldn't necessarily know the difference that it didn't have a foundation. Our communities are so often filled with many people who have built what appears to be a Christian life. But many of them, so many of them, lack the foundation. It looks great on the outside, but recognize that's a point of similarity between these two professing Christians. There's a fourth similarity between these two men. And that is that the truth of both men's lives will be revealed at the judgment. And that's what the storm in this story here represents. Some say that the storm here is, is the, the storms of life that, that uh, come in and, and, and reveal a, a false profession. And of course, in some cases, that is true, yes. But the storm here in this case, it represents the storm of God's final and complete judgment. And that's for a couple of reasons. First of all, just from a language perspective, when Jesus speaks the parables normally, he says the kingdom of heaven is like this. He uses the present tense. But in verse 24 and verse 26, notice what Jesus says. He says the wise man will be like this. The foolish man will be like this. He's using the future tense. He's saying that at some point in the future, everyone will either be like a wise man or a foolish man. Also, Jesus is talking about final judgment only in verses 21 through, through 23. And so there's no reason to think that he's, he's changed his, his tune here in this passage, in this parable. Also, in the Old Testament, Jesus, uh, God often pitches storms as a kind of judgment that he Uses even his final coming judgment. I'll give you an example. Turn with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah 23 this morning. 23, verse 19. Jeremiah 23, 19 says, Behold, the storm of the Lord has gone forth in wrath, even a whirling tempest. It will swell down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has performed and carried out the purposes of his heart. In the last days, you will clearly understand it. And so Jeremiah here in this passage, as he talks about false teachers and false prophets, he's saying that there is a day that is coming when God will unleash his full fury and wrath, and it will be as, the, as a penetrating storm of judgment, a hurricane force, a storm of cosmic proportions. So think of it kind of like this. At the judgment seat, at the judgment seat, Jesus will subject the profession of every single person who calls him Lord to the storm of his penetrating omniscience and presence. And the one without a foundation, that life will ultimately be destroyed. There are four striking similarities between these two men in this story. But Jesus' main point is not what these houses have in common, but rather it is their stark separation. The separation, the difference between these two men and their profession of faith. The most obvious difference is that, of course, these men have different foundations, right? The wise man built his life on bedrock, on a solid foundation. The foolish man built his life on the sand. Second difference between these men is their different destinies. They have tragically, radically different destinies. A profession Christian who has built his life on the foundation of rock, he will endure the judgment. He will prove to be a genuine disciple and enter into God's kingdom forever. On the other hand, the professing Christian who did not build his life on the rock, he will prove to be a false disciple at the judgment, so much so that that Christian facade will collapse, will fall away, and be nothing but rubble. And in verse 23, 
Jesus will say to him, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. So the key question is this. As we look at this parable, as we look at this story this morning, what is the foundation? Because the one with it, the one with the foundation, will survive the judgment. The one without will not. You ask most Christians, well, what is the, what is the foundation represented in here? What is the rock in this parable? And they'll tell you, well, the, the rock is Christ, of course. And, and of, it's true in various places in Scripture, Christ is called a rock, 1 Corinthians 10, for example. We also sing that, that great and wonderful hymn, on Christ is solid rock I stand, all other ground is, is sinking stand. I love that hymn. It borrows from this very parable. But it's not actually the point of this parable. The rock in this parable, the foundation upon which the wise man builds his life, is more specific than that. It's Christ, yes, but with some explanation as well. Look again at verse 24 in Matthew 7. Everyone who hears these words of mine, underline this in your Bible, and acts on them may be compared to the wise man who built his house on the rock. Verse 26, everyone who hears these words, underline this, and does not act on them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. You see, both of these men, they heard Jesus' teaching. But the key difference is that one acted on it, on Jesus' words, and the other did not. These words here act on them. It literally means everyone hearing these words of mine and doing it. Everyone hearing my teaching and as a pattern of life is seeking to obey. You see, the foundation here is more than just hearing Christ's teaching. The foundation is more than just believing Christ's teaching. It's more than just respecting Christ's teaching. The foundation here is a walk of obedience to the truth of Christ's teaching. You can have an intellectual knowledge of Christ. You can make a verbal profession of Jesus Christ. And both are essential when it comes to our salvation. But that can never be a substitute for obedience. Anyone can call him Lord. Anyone can hear his words. Anyone can listen. Anyone can study. Anyone can ponder until their minds are stuffed full with his teaching. But those things without a walk of obedience is what Christ here calls foolish. What is obedience? What is the foundation of rock? This obedience is a life of total submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Remember, even the fool will call him Lord, right? So this is more than a profession. Let me ask you the question this morning. Is the lordship of Jesus Christ, which you profess, one of your life's major realities? This has always been the difference between a true and a false believer. Even in the Old Testament, this was the standard between true and false believers. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 33 this morning. Ezekiel chapter 33. God is speaking through the prophet Ezekiel here, and he says to him, in verse 30 of Ezekiel 33. But as for you, son of man, your fellow citizens who talk about you by the walls and in the doorways of the houses speak to one another, each to his brother, saying, Come, now and hear the message which comes forth from the Lord. Ezekiel, he was a subject of a lot of discussion going on in and around the city. People liked him. People said, let's go listen to Ezekiel. They come to you as a people, they come and sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth, and their heart goes after their gain. They loved Ezekiel. They loved hearing him teach. Notice verse 32, though. Behold, you are to them like a sensual song by one who has a beautiful voice and plays well on the instrument. 
for they hear your words, but they do not practice them. Verse 33, so when it comes, and that's talking about judgment, when judgment comes to pass, as surely it will, then they will know that a prophet has been in their midst. These people, they weren't believers. And God is going to bring his wrath, his judgment upon them. But they sat there and they listened as if they truly were. This has always been the distinction between a true and a false disciple. True disciple hears the word of God and faithfully seeks to walk in obedience. Now it's not true, of course, that we perfectly keep God's word. Remember, even in the Sermon on the Mount, right? We're never perfectly sinless. Jesus taught his disciples that every day they were to pray, Lord, forgive us of our debts. Of course we sin. We sin every day. But a true believer's life is marked by a pattern of heart submission to the Lord Jesus Christ and his teaching. The foundation that distinguishes a genuine Christian from a false Christian is not just saying that Jesus is Lord. It's not just having the right doctrine as these people did. It's not just having a spiritual zeal and fervency as these people did. It's not serving in some ministry as these people did. It's not believing in Jesus' words as they did. It's not even building what looks like an external Christian life as these people did. Listen very carefully. The foundation of rock is a heart that bows completely to the lordship of Jesus Christ. You must hear his words and constantly, consistently seek to obey them. On the other hand, the foundation of sand is when a false disciple hears Jesus' teaching and doesn't consistently seek to walk in obedience. Don't misunderstand me. We are not saved by our obedience ever. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in the finished work of Christ alone. Amen. But when there is genuine faith, it will always produce, after conversion, a heart that longs to walk in obedience. And that is what the Lord is the point that the Lord is making here in this passage. As I said at the start of our sermon, we live in an age of cheap grace. So many people talk about, Jesus, God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. You want to get out of hell, just believe in Jesus and everything, all your problems will will be fixed. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want that kind of life? But you can't just have Jesus as Savior. Our salvation doesn't work like that. Christ comes as a package deal. Salvation comes as a package deal. You cannot have Christ as Savior unless you also obey him as Lord. You can't segment him into two parts. You can't say, yeah, I want Jesus, but that day-to-day walking in obedience, eh, that's not for me. I want to rule and reign in my own life, do whatever I want to do, however I want to do it. The Christian faith does not work like that. Christ is a package deal. He is both your Savior and he is your Lord. And you are to obey him as such. There is no middle foundation. No middle foundation for the indifferent and the half serious. There is either a life built on Christ and obedience to his word or the sand of self-deception. Remember that the sandy foundation isn't the straight-up pagan life. The sandy foundation is someone living the Christian life. Someone living the Christian life among us, talking Christianese, saying the right things. But yet there is no true heart submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And when judgment day comes, as surely it will, that life will be exposed for what it truly is, a false profession. So what now for us this morning? Where do we go from here? As I said at the beginning, we must take this opportunity to examine our own hearts before the Lord. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. Ask yourself this question this morning. Have I built a Christian life that is merely a front for sin and disobedience? 
or is the truth which I profess displayed by a life of obedience to the truth of God's word? To those of us here this morning who know the Lord Jesus Christ as true and genuine disciples, be encouraged, encouraged. Examine your heart this morning. See what areas that you need to have greater submission to Jesus in. Remember, there's no specific sin that Jesus mentions here in this parable, only that we would have a foundation of rock that is Christ and obedience to his word. And that's, him, that's on purpose because that gives us a chance to examine and see if there are any areas where I need greater submission to Jesus. What areas? We'll start by examining how your relationship is going with the Lord. How is your time in prayer? How is your time reading his word? How is your time studying his word? Examine your life. See if you have any idols, things that you love and worship more than God. Money, possessions, comfort, school, family. What do you prioritize in your life? Church or your social life? Are you actively serving in the body here? Are you using your spiritual gift to minister to the saints? Are you discipling someone or being discipled yourself? What about contentment issues? Are you fully content with where the Lord has you now? Or are you unhappy and striving and pushing in your own strength against him? Be encouraged. Examine, by, examine your life and see what the Lord is doing. But always be humble enough to admit that you've never made it when it comes to obedience. There is no such thing as sinless perfection, Right? And so each and every day we need to spend time in prayer on our knees before the Lord, asking him to help us put off sin and put on righteousness. If you sit here this morning and you are even a little unsure of your foundation, if you look at your life, if you look at the good works that you do, and you honestly say that that foundation of obedience is missing. Don't ignore the Spirit's prompting this morning. This parable also serves as an invitation to you. Praise God, we still live in a day of grace, amen? The storm of God's final judgment has not yet come. The tribulation has not yet come. There is still hope for you. So what do you do this morning? You come before a holy God acknowledging that you are a hopeless sinner in need of saving. You acknowledge that you have nothing he wants, nothing that will please him, nothing that will satisfy him. You come before him and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me, make me new. Give me a heart of obedience. Give me the capacity to obey you. You humble yourself. You give up your pride, you give up your rebellion this morning, and you ask for him to receive you. Why? Because Yahweh saves. Yahweh rescues. Jesus will save his people from his sins, from their sins, as Gabriel told Joseph. Jesus became a curse, dying in our place, taking upon him, bearing in our place the wrath of God. When that change takes place in your life, he will make you a new person. He'll give you new desires. He's not just going to change you a little bit. He's going to radically change your life. He will give you new desires. You'll love new things and hate the things that you used to love. He's going to declare you righteous, robe you in Christ's righteousness. He is molding you into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. May this be the day of your salvation this morning. Brethren, there are two options before us this morning. A life of obedience built on the foundation of the rock or the sand of self-deception. Which one are you? Let's pray. Our good and gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are a God who desires a relationship with us. You do not leave us stranded or alone, but Father, you have given us your Holy Spirit to guide and to lead us in our walk of obedience. 
Father, we pray that you would help us to examine our lives, see where we need greater submission to the Lordship of Christ. Father, help us to weed out sin, help us to put off sin and put on righteousness. We thank you for Jesus Christ and his poured out life on our behalf, knowing that it is nothing that we have that can make us right before you. It is only Jesus Christ and his blood.